Well, so we've got a question here. When we talk about uh, these ideas applying anywhere around the world, we got a question here uh, from Malaysia, from Benny, who asked about culture change. Um, the working culture here in Malaysia, he's an industrial engineer, is very different than the one in Japan. The current situation in my factory is that the operators here do not want to engage in improvement programs because they feel it does not benefit them. How do I change that culture? How can I convince workers that continuous improvement is a win-win for them? I understand that in Japan, workers do continuous improvement because they see it as an achievement and no rewards or prizes are needed to motivate them. So my, my first comment to this, um, I've only been to Japan a couple of times, and when I visited Toyota, our tour guide, um, she was uh, a woman who worked in the public affairs department. She was, I think, essentially a full-time tour guide and did other public relations work. During the tour, we asked her, have you gotten to implement a Kaizen? She was talking about Kaizen. And yep. she said, well, yeah, I, I have. And, and she showed us where, as we went through the tour, there are various spots where she was supposed to stop and talk. And in each of those places, there was a hook for her to put her her bag. It was, I don't know if it was a purse or a briefcase. It was kind of in that in-between. And she said that those hooks were her Kaizen idea, that she didn't like setting her bag on the ground, even though the plant was fairly clean. It was her idea for the hooks. And she said she talked to her supervisor. She mentioned the idea. The supervisor said, yes, maintenance installed the hooks. She That was purely out of um, self-motivation. She didn't want her bag to get dirty. And so I think there, there's an important lesson there, whether it's Malaysia or what I've seen with hospitals in, in Thailand or um, organizations in the U.S. The way you show employees that Kaizen is win-win is you ask them to come up with ideas that would be a win for them. That right. ends up being a win for the organization. You just you seek out those opportunities, right? What do you, what do you say? Yeah. I like to phrase it as what frustrates you at your workplace? That's just an easy place to start. What we see almost invariably when an organization is, is truly doing that kind of bottom up, they recognize that 80% of their improvement potential is sitting in the front lines. How do we unlock that? Right. What we see almost invariably is that if you if you look at the categorization of the improvements that are implemented in that first year, staff satisfaction takes an overwhelming majority of the percentage. We often see over 50% of all improvements in that first wave. Then if you keep tracking out over time, you start seeing things like safety, quality, finance, following, because you, they kind of got rid of all the things that were bothering them, and then they could see past their own one to two feet and, and, and really delve into the process. So. It's a great way to get buy-in, and yeah. it's a great way to. I mean, from, there's a staff morale issue. There is um, probably a, an added safety benefit of the hook, right? I mean, I, there, someone may have tripped on the bag. Who knows? Right. So what's what's so interesting is the the intended impact sometimes is not the actual impact of an improvement. Right. Um, sometimes you just you know the the classic example we talk about with this, Mark, was the, the nurse that said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we just called in the patient's prescription to the pharmacy, our local pharmacy, right down the hall, and so when they walk out, the, the prescription's ready. Well, the, intend, the, the unintended benefit of that was that it increased the pharmacy's output by over $200,000 a month because right. some of these were some really expensive prescriptions, but it was actually done for patient satisfaction, you know? Right, right. Um, so uh, to me, that's the, the, the best place to start is just what bothers you and let's fix that. And I, I don't know if it's a, a cultural thing because we also know plenty of places in Japan that aren't doing Kaizen well at all. Yeah. So it's not just, oh, well, you just need to be Japanese and, and this will just right. magically happen. Yeah, and I think there's powerful lessons about tapping into intrinsic motivation, whether you know, it's Masaki Amai and, and the book you and I both – read and been inspired by his book, Kaizen, talks about, you know, you, you just want people participating in the improvement process. Um, more, you know, current, uh, Masaki Mai is still around, but uh, Paul Akers in his book, Two Second Lean, he asked people, come up with an, uh, a small improvement that'll save two seconds in doing something. Um, 
a little bit of time savings can have that dual benefit of reducing frustration, making your work easier, and having benefit in terms of capacity and, and uh, output for the organization, which can have financial benefits. So um, I, I think how, you know we go looking for win-win, and even if we err on the side of being only a win for the employee, like you said, Greg, a lot of times really that ends up being win-win for the organization. They they start participating, and then over time you discover they are coming up with ideas that very directly save money, which I think is different than organizations that focus too much on um, asking people to do cost cutting. That doesn't engage people the way finding something that uh, makes your work easier engages people. That's great. I, I think it's going to tie into the next question as well. Do um, you want to start with that one? Yeah, well, I was going to make one other point when it comes to incentives or rewards. Um, I mean, I think there's there's two uh, mental models that organizations and leaders often have before they start with Kaizen. One is, well, we've got to make it mandatory. We've got to require participation. I said, well, no, if you invite people to work on problems that matter to them, you're tapping into that intrinsic motivation. The second assumption is, well, we have to give an incentive. And I've just, I've seen... If leaders are engaging people in this Kaizen style, people will participate because they want to, because it's interesting, because it's in their self-benefit. And sometimes the idea of doing rewards and incentives just becomes uh, a bureaucracy that can be a distraction or, or gets in the way. And, and if you want to get into the nitty-gritty of the social science behind this, uh, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, it, right. it, it kind of breaks down the, the science behind this. I think, you know, we're, we're talking to one of our customers and they had a, a quota for a number of improvements per employee per year. And they actually gave us some feedback and we, we are going to be releasing, I think, in the next version, a, a feature that, that they came up with, um, one I've been wanting to do for a long time, but, you know, I'm fanatical about waiting for a customer to kind of sponsor it um, before it, it finds its way in. And we called it a target. Um, line and they they subsequently have kind of redirected their their thought process here and said oh well, we're not interested in quotas anymore because of the exact reason you mentioned it creates right. you know, really bad behavior I don't think that that means that you you can't have a target or a goal right it's it's a matter of you know we would like to see one or two improvements or five improvements per person per year that's not saying we're going to make it man like we're not going to get to that by making it mandatory that people right. do that. We're going to we can still set that target or that goal and and not do quotas. And, and right. certainly, I think knowing where you want to end up um, is, is really important to the success of the journey that you're going on. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a difference between an aspirational goal and a quota. If you don't reach an aspirational goal. You learn from it, you adapt, you move on. When you've got a quota and people fear getting in trouble for not hitting the quota, that's where things get really dysfunctional. 